Hey guys welcome back to our YouTube channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if M Sasuke and Naruto were couple. This is part 1, and if you want more then please leave a like and share with your friends. Let get in the video. Angry shouts rose up from the empty streets of Kanahagakur as a small boy frantically ran through alleyways. His face was full of fear as he tore through the deserted streets, desperately looking for a way to escape his pursuers, a decent-sized mob of villagers, and assorted genin intent on dealing harm to the five-year-old. His little legs continued to carry him through the maze of buildings, deftly dodging and ducking behind buildings and corners, which ultimately had no really effect on losing the enraged villagers. More and more seemed to pour into the mob, pitchforks, knives and other weapons at the ready, should they capture the little blonde. Get him. Get the demon. Let's make it pay for what it did. Similar cries rang out as the boy steadily began to slow down, allowing his lead, already small, to begin waning. Turning a corner, he collided with something much bigger than he was which sent him back to the ground, blood trickling out from his nose. Looking up, his cerulean eyes widened in fear as he stared into the blank and unreadable visage of the white-masked ninja of the village. The giant's coal eyes bore down on the child as if they were looking into his very soul. Well well, well, looks like I get to rid the village of the demon. He said maliciously, a maniacal look appearing in his eyes as they changed from cold black to an even colder red, adorned with three comma marks around the pupil. The maniacal smile stretched out on his mask-covered face as he slowly unsheathed the standard Anbu katana from his back, relishing in the fear that seemed to radiate off the small child's body. I will finish what the Yandame has started. Tears poured from the boy's eyes as he helplessly watched the Anbu above him level his instrument of death to his neck. Such a pathetic showing for a demon, crying like a little baby. It doesn't matter, your death by my hands will be the cementing of the Achiha clan forever. He boasted with a small chuckle. His eyes shifted, however, from the quivering boy to the mob that had caught up to the two, looks of unbridled contempt aimed directly at the boy. Let us take a few shots at the demon, the leader of the mob said, with a malicious smirk on his face. He brandished a large butcher's knife in his hands. Shouts of agreement rang out from behind him as the villagers slowly began to stalk up to the scared boy, weapons raised above their heads. Take this, you demon. The leader yelled, bringing down the knife. A large gash appeared across the boy's chest following the swipe. The young blonde cried out in pain, fresh tears flowing down his face and mixing with the blood already on the ground. The leader laughed evilly as he watched the boy writhe in pain, viciously stomping on his chest, taunting, come on demon. Is this all you can do, lie around and take punishment? What kind of demon are you? Why? Why are you doing this? What have I done to deserve this? The child asked softly, curling in a ball to avoid the blows from the mob that came as an answer. The soft plea fell on deaf ears as the villagers continued to beat on the small child while laughter and more hateful words spat down at the quivering, blood-drenched boy. His eyes clenched together tightly in pain as he could feel the weight of the blows breaking down his body. He opened them slightly as the blows stopped for a moment. Looking up, fear washed over his body as he felt the cold steel of the masked ninja's blade against his throat. And thus ends the tyranny of the QB no Kitsune. The Anbu said gravely, edging the blade into the supposed QB no Kitsune. Now die. As the sword was raised, the boy gave himself up to the prospect of death. Am I am I going to die? His eyes shut tightly as he waited for the cold grip of death to take him, but it never came. Instead of the sound of a head being lopped off, gasps and collapsing bodies were the only noises that filled the boy's ears. Weakly opening his eyes, he was greeted by the backs of two other Anbu, the villagers unconscious on the ground at their feet, the original Anbu was nowhere to be found. Why you? Saved. Me. Onichan, and Ison. He said weakly, slowly slipping into unconsciousness. One of the Anbu turned back to the sleeping boy, their long purple hair whipping about the masked face. Neri-chan. They cried out, kneeling down next to the boy. Kakashi-senpai. Neri-chan's unconscious. Betting the attention of the other Anbu, the purple-haired one gently cradled the boy's unconscious form into her chest, as if to protect him. Why would someone do this to a little boy? Because they can't tell the difference between a katana and its sheath. All they see is the demon, the other Anbu answered, running a gloved hand through the mop of gravity defying silver hair on his head. Walking to the pair, his solitary eye focused on the small boy's slowly healing wounds. You gao, we need to get Naruto to the Hokage immediately. Right, the Nico Mask Ninja said, cradling the young blonde closer against her breast, silent tears rolling down behind her mask. Please be alright, Neri-chan. With an unseen signal, the Anbu quickly took off to the tower, leaving the villagers there unconscious or unmoving out of fear. Not a few feet away laid the body of the Achiha Anbu, his head completely severed from his body, his blood splattered on the walls that surrounded. His eyes were still open in shock, the blank mask still on his face. Uneven footsteps sounded from the shadows, the sound of a cane accompanying them. Pitiful, simply pitiful. 
I give you one simple mission to complete and you go and get yourself killed, a cold creepy sounding voice berated from the shadows. Slinking out from the darkness came a haggard looking man, his right eye covered in bandages as was his right arm. He planted his cane against the mask of the deceased Ichiha clansman, you are of no use to root anymore. Now beggin. With that, he pushed easily through the mask with the cane, stabbing completely through the Ichiha's forehead, his blood and brain matter squelching under the wooden walking stick. I take that back, you have one more use for me. Kneeling down, the broken old man removed the shattered mask, eyeing the still activated Sharingan eyes greedily. I'll just add these to my collection. Drawing out a kunai, he ripped out both of the man's eyes and sealed them away in a scroll. This is truly all you were worth, Shisui Ichiha. Goodbye. Unknown PLACE. Die demon. Go back to hell where you belong. Kill him. Finish what the Yandame started. Curse them. Those dirty villagers are the lowest of the low. Naruto, I'm so sorry, this is all my fault. Okage's OFFIC. An exasperated sigh came from the wrinkled lips of the Sandame Hokage, here is in Siratobi. His grey bearded chin was resting on his steepled fingers, his eyes locked on the imposing figure sitting across his desk. So you mean to tell me that the man that attempted to kidnap the High Uga heir was not acting upon the wishes of Kumo itself, but for his own selfish desires? And those desires were to make his own clan and destroy Kumo? Am I correct so far, Raikage Dono? The man addressed nodded in response to the questions. And that's why we want to rewrite an alliance with Kanoha again. Our country's economy is starting to fail, and we can't stay the way we are and survive. Supporting Kiri in their time of rebuilding takes its toll on us. We've given them too many missions for their economy's bolstering, but it was all for the better. The Raikage explained, leaning back in his chair and stroking his blonde goatee. Well then, I see no reason to not draw up another alliance, he said, pulling out a scroll from his desk. After writing for a while, he pulled out the Hokage stamp and marked it as an official document. And that's it. Our alliance is now official, he announced, standing in unison with the Raikage. It's been a pleasure to work with you, Raikage-sama, he said, extending his hand to the muscular man. The motion was interrupted when two Anbu slammed through the doors, a bloody bundle in Niko's arms. Hokage-sama. The Inumask Anbu yelled out, startling the two Kage. It's Naruto. He was attacked again. Another Anbu nearly killed him. Not again. Here is in growled out, letting off a small portion of killer intent. Where are the people who did this to him? I've already sent other Anbu to take them to Ibiki, Inu reported as Nico sat down on the couch, Naruto still sleeping in her arms. A slight hissing noise came from the boy's body as his wounds were healing themselves, albeit slowly. Araikage just stood there staring intently at the small boy, Hokage Dono, this boy, he is a Jinchuriki, isn't he? He asked, getting shocked looks from the others. How could you tell? Nico asked, unconsciously pulling Naruto closer to her chest, as if to protect him. No one would attack an innocent child for no reason. I know that most Jinchuriki have had terrible lives, so it only makes sense that this child is in fact a blessing from Kami herself, he explained, walking over to the boy. He looked down on the boy with a critical eye. The blessing from Kami you say? I've never heard someone put a Jinchuriki on such a high level of importance. Hiruzen remarked, surprised at the Raikage's choice of words. All the people in Kumo are deeply rooted in their belief in Kami, the fact that we have a clan with one of Kami's gift bloodline, Kami's lightning. Also, we've learned that the Bijuu are the protectors of a certain area, and Hachibi and Nibi happen to be the protectors of Kumo, the Raikage explained, gently ruffling the sleeping boy's hair. The two Jinchuriki are held in high honor among everyone in the village, seen as heroes and protectors of the village. Hiruzen went silent in thought, pondering the difference of Jinchuriki treatment by the two villages. They give them that amount of respect. I wonder if that life would be better for little Naruto. It's not like these prejudiced bigots will ever accept him for the hero that he is, the way the Yandane wanted it to be. Minato, I'm sorry, but I think I'll have to have Naruto leave the village. Raikage Dono, how would you feel about having another gift from Kami? He asked, getting surprised looks from his two Anbu subordinates. His life here is nothing if not terrible, as you can see. He's an orphan, his father having passed away in the attack of the QB and his mother in childbirth he stated solemnly, his head bowed, shadows covering his eyes. Looking down at the child, the Raikage stood there in silence. Yes, the opportunity of having a third Jinchuriki in Kumo was a very appealing idea, but it didn't seem right to take Kanoha's only protector away from them. But, that reason did seem insignificant in comparison to the boy's condition. An orphan for all his young life, and unknowingly given the burden of being the Jinchuriki of a village that regarded him as a demon. The choice seemed very clear to Inao. Yes, I will take the young boy, but before I take him, I would like to know his name and take any belongings or inheritance he would have with him. Very well, here is inside. 
motioning to Inu, go to Naruto's apartment and gather up all of his clothes and whatever else he has with him there. Nodding, Kakashi quickly shushing it out of the room. Turning to the wall, the aged Hokage walked over to the pictures of the previous Hokages. Focusing on the blonde Kage, he gently placed a wrinkled hand on the face of his predecessor, a unseen seal glowing under his palm. The photo slid away revealing a safe, already opening as the photo slid, revealing a couple of scrolls along with a small box, all labeled for the young Naruto. These are all the things that Naruto's parents left for him. It doesn't seem like much, but he actually has much more that he can't bring with him to Kumo. Um, Hokage-sama. Why did you take those things out of the Yandame's photo? Nico asked, Naruto still sleeping in her arms. Well, it seems as if it was obvious. Naruto is his only son. His true name is Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. Here is an explained, handing the scrolls and the box to E, gently smirking on the inside at the mask shock from the female Anbu. His eyes turned back to Kakashi who had just come back into the room, a small scroll in his hands. And that's all he has unfortunately. Just promise me something Raikage Dono, make sure he becomes the strong hero his father wanted him to be. I promise Hokage Dono. I will personally see to it that he will grow even stronger than his father, he said, pocketing the scrolls in his robe and walking over to the sleeping Jinchuriki. And you never know, he may even be my successor. But that he gently took Naruto out of Yugao's arms and proceeded to leave the office. He was stopped just short of the exit by the voice of the Hokage. Hold on just a minute, Raikage Dono, he said, turning his attention to the female subordinate, Nico, I have a new S-rank mission for you. Go with Raikage Dono and take care of Naruto and Kumo. And take off your mask, you won't need it there. Yes, Hokage-sama, the Anbu replied, slipping off her mask to reveal the beautiful face of Yuga Yuzuki. Just one moment Raikage-sama, I will meet you at the gate shortly, she said with a curt bow before she shushing it out of the office to her home. Are you entirely sure that this is truly needed? Inu asked looking at the spot where Yuga was left. Yes, it is, Inu. It would be best for Naruto if he has someone he feels comfortable with when he's there, Hiruzen said sadly, looking at the still sleeping child he saw as his grandson in the Raikage's tanned and muscular arm. A silent tear slid out of his eye as he watched a tan man take him out the room. I'm sorry Minato, Kishina, but I'm doing this for Naruto's own good. Sitting back at at his desk, he dismissed Inu with a wave of his hand. He looked over the many documents on his desk, dreading the ever-growing stack of paperwork that had been set aside due to the impromptu meeting with the Raikage. Feeling another familiar presence enter the room, he didn't even have to look up to meet the masked figure standing at the head of his desk. Are you fully prepared for your mission tomorrow? He asked, his eyes never leaving the papers he was working on. Yes I am Hokage-sama, but are you sure that this needs to be done? Yes, they have overstepped their boundaries with this plan of theirs. Wanting to perform a coup is treason, and you are the best person for this job, he explained, looking up at the masked female. I'm counting on you to fully complete this mission. The safety of Kanoha rests in your hands, Mitachi. Yes Hokage-sama, the weasel mask Anbu said, bowing and disappearing in a swirl of leaves. Unknown L-O-C-A-T-I-O-N. The sound of dripping and sloshing water was all that greeted Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze as darkness receded from his vision. Sitting up he became aware of the water in which he was lying and his sore-like surroundings. Where am I? Last thing I remember was Kakashi and Aisen and Yugao Onichin saving from that mob and that Anbu. He thought aloud, the memories of the beating still fresh in his mind. The words the villagers said however, hurt the young boy deeper than any wound had. Get him. Get the demon. Let's make it pay for what it did. The words cemented themselves into his very mind as fresh tears streamed down his face. Why do they do that? What have I done to deserve this? He softly cried to himself. His sobs stopped for a moment when he heard that more sobs joined his. Why does this happen to him? He's just a child. Sitting up in the water, Naruto strained his ears to find the sobbing voice. Slowly making his way down the damp and water-filled hall he followed the soft sobbing. He finally ended up in a large room with large bars slicing through the center of the room, a seal on the lock. Behind the bars was a shadowed figure slumping down, its shoulders shaking violently with its sobs. They don't even deserve to be called humans. Not even demons would attack a child like that. Um hello. Who's there? Naruto asked, causing the figure to jump, startled. The figure's head snapped forward to Naruto, its unseen eyes opened wide. I'm sorry, did I startle you? The figure couldn't help but smile at the young boy's quickness to be at fault. No it's not your fault, I was just surprised to see someone else here. The figure stood up and made its way over to the bars of the separating it from Naruto. To tell you the truth Narukun, I actually was expecting to see you some time in the future, but you seem to be really eager to meet me. The figure said, a slight giggle in its voice. It held a sweet tone about it, one that made Naruto feel at peace in the figure's presence. Um, how do you know who I am? 
He shyly asked, slightly shuffling his feet in nervousness. Due to his frequent beatings, he learned not fully trust someone he had just met, them knowing his name was just another reason to be nervous around them. The figure slightly sighed and looked back to the small boy, I've known for you for all your life Narukun, and I've been with you for all time too. Biggles shook the figure's shoulders as Naruto's face hilariously twisted in thought as he tried to wrap his young five-year-old brain around this thought. I'm sorry Narukun, but I should tell you who I am exactly. I am the guardian of Hai no Kuni, the QB no Kitsune, her well, I was until I was sealed inside you, it explained, stepping out from the shadows. The darkness revealed a beautiful teenage girl, her vibrant red hair rolling down her face, ending in soft curls that matched her equally exotic eyes and ruby red lips. Her form was clad in a simple black kimono, red trimmings along the edges that hugged and accentuated her figure perfectly. The most peculiar thing about the girl was the red kitsune ears and tails that adorned her figure. W wait, so the reason I've gotten all those beatings, when they called me a demon, they thought I was you. But how could they think I was cute like you QB chan Naruto asked sweetly, causing a blush to appear upon the face of QB. It soon disappeared, however, as tears began to well up in her ruby eyes. I'm glad you see it that way Narukun, she said, a slight sniffle with her soft melodic voice. And to think, anyone else would be cursing the day that they had me sealed inside them. I mean, I was the one who is responsible for all the beatings you've endured, Narukun, all the hatred towards you, all of the glares and threats, they're all my fault. My fault that I even had to be sealed into you, my fault that your life is ruined forever. The QB cried, tears of guilt rolling freely down her cheeks. All the emotion that had been bottled up since he was first mistreated at the orphanage was now poured out. Yes, the great QB no Kitsune, Queen of the Bijuu and Princess Guardian of Hai no Kuni, was crying excessively, and over her jailer, of all people. Please don't cry QB Chan, it's not your fault. QB's teary eyes looked down to see a mop of blonde hair in front of her, Naruto's small arms wrapped around her waist. I'm strong so I can bear the burden by myself. QB's lips cracked in a small smile as she kneeled down, wrapping the young boy in a hug, a few tears still escaping her eyes, thank you so much Naru-kun. I know I don't deserve your kindness, but thank you anyway. Feeling the boy's arms leave her waist, her smile grew when he started petting her tails, getting an almost unnoticeable purr from the vixen. I do have one question though, QB Chan, he asked, his childlike curiosity coming froth in full bloom. Yes. What is it Naru-kun? What's your name? His blue eyes looked back up at her, their pure cerulean depth seemingly looking into her very soul. Benahem. Wow, that means Red Princess right? So does that mean you're a real princess? Close Nerukun, it means Crimson Princess and no, it doesn't make me a princess, although that's one of my titles. Now I'm pretty sure it's time for you to wake up. Benahem giggled, hugging the little boy with her tails as his image slowly disappeared. I Benahem Onichin. Naruto smiled, waving to Vixen before fully leaving her sight. Thank you so much Narukun for accepting me into your life so quickly. I promise to help you achieve all of your goals and make your parents proud of you. F-O-R-E-S-T. The loud yawn rang out between two travelers as they both landed on dirt road from the trees, one of them setting down the bundle that was on her back on their feet. Did you have a good sleep Narukun? She asked smoothing out his white shirt. You were asleep for a long time. Indeed he had been, for when he fell unconscious after the attack it was well into the night and now the sun was high in the sky. I was asleep. But I was talking with Benahem Onichin, he said, his face taking his cute thinking pose, his whiskered cheek slightly twitching. Benahem? I'm guessing that she's the QB no Kitsune, right? He asked, shaking the boy out his thoughts. Naruto couldn't form any words for a good while, he just looked up and up at the muscular giant in front of him. That's the Raikage, Naruchan, Yugao said, answering his unsaid question, stifling the laugh that threatened to escape her lips at his quick expression change. So is he friends with a Jiji-san? Is he strong like him, too? He couldn't help but smile at the child's eagerness to ask questions about his relation with Kanoha's Kage. Um, Yugao Onichin. Where are we? The purple-haired woman smiled as they began to walk down the dirt path, Naruto between them. You and I are going to live in Kumo for a while. Kind of like a vacation. As soon as she finished speaking, a large structure rose up over the small hill on which they were. It resembled one of the ancient triangular structures of the ancient East Naruto had seen in the few books he was able to take from the library, the only difference being long wires ran from a corner of the top of the building to wooden poles that pockmarked the streets. The cables running to other buildings as well. Naruto's cerulean eyes widened extremely at the sight, the building itself was much bigger than even the Hokage's mansion in Kanoha. Welcome to Kumagakur, Naruto. Naruto gaped up in awe at the massive structure that stood in the center of the village, buildings and poles flanking it. The tower stood so tall that it dwarfed anything that Naruto had ever seen before. Come along little one, we still aren't there yet. 
B said, gently pushing Naruto forward with his large hands. The blonde quickly fell in step with the Raikage, his former Anbu caretaker a few paces behind them. So, Raikage-sama, where will Naruto and I be staying? She asked, fiddling with the scroll that held all of Naruto's earthly possessions, along with her own wardrobe and other essential items. There is no need to worry about that Yuga-san, he replied, still keeping an eye on the hyperactive ball of energy in front of him. My younger brother has taken care of it. As a matter of fact, there he is. Standing at the village gates was a tanned and muscular man garbed in the standard white flak vest of the Jonin of Kumo, along with baggy black pants. He had his white Kumo forehead protector tied around his forehead, right at the base of his blonde, nearly white, cornrows. He was holding a little blonde girl on his shoulders who was waving frantically at the group as they were walking closer. Yo bro. Why have you been so slow? The man rhymed cornily, the two adults sweat dropping at his childish antics. You've been making me waiting for so long with you, Jito. A small fist to the head stopped the man from continuing his rapping rant. Be quiet, Kawabi. Itasen just got back from his twip to Kanoha, so let him have some peace. The little girl on his shoulders yelled at him, repeatedly pounding on Kawabi's. Her fist left his head a pulsating red bump instead of the deep tan color it usually held. It's times like this I wonder who is the real adult in this weird family of mine. He sighed looking less than amused at his brother's and adoptive daughter's antics. Yujito, please stop harassing Karabi like that. Karabi, enough of your terrible rhyming, it only ends up with you getting hit by little Yujito. Aw come on bro, don't be messing with my flow. Karabi shot back, the rhymes back with a vengeance. The shades wearing man was totally unaware of the twin tick marks both E's and Yujito's faces. Apparently it was true what they say, like father, like daughter. A few seconds and three mini welts on his head later, Karabi finally gave in, much to the pleasure of Yujito. So bro, are these the two people from Kanoha that are going to live here? He asked, jabbing a thumb at Naruto and Yujito. Yes, this is them. I take it that you have their apartment set up? Raikage asked, ushering the two former Kanoha civilians in front of him. If you would take care of them it would be greatly appreciated, I do have to get back to my job after all. Before Karabi could say anything however, the muscular Kage shushing it away in a bright light and loud crackle, a scorch mark left in his wake. Of course he would do that, dump all the work on me. Karabi grumbled to himself. Lifting the small blonde off of his shoulders he smiled to the two. Right this way, I'll take you to where you'll stay. His smile was wiped off again by another bonk on his head, thanks to an impressive jump and punch combo from Yujito. The man nursed the bump with an angry look at his niece, before he started walking into the village at a moderate pace, Yugao and the two children following close behind. So, Karabi-san, just where is our apartment? Yugao asked, slightly looking back as to keep an eye on the two children behind her. Naruto was talking animatedly as always, Yujito giggling with him from time to time. We're barely here for 10 minutes and he already has a friend. This will be much better for him. She was so wrapped up in her thoughts that she didn't notice the Karabi had stopped until it was almost too late. Luckily, her ninja reflexes were enough to save her from colliding into his back. Looking up, her purple eyes widened at the sheer size of the building in front of her. Standing a good five stories tall, the building was a deep brown color that seemed to be the commonplace in Kumo. Furnished terraces sat under most every window, deck chairs and potted plants sitting out in the sun. Welcome to the Nai Niko Estates, named after our very own Nibi no Nekamata Jinchiriki, Yujito Nai. Karabi boasted, a large bright smile on his face. Yujito had a much more embarrassed look, her cheeks a bright red and head bowed low, as if to avoid Naruto's gaze. Kawabi, stop it. You're embarrassing me. Said girl whined, her inability to properly say her R's showing greatly. Yuga couldn't help but smile at the girl, Naruto on the other hand was stunned at the revelation. She's a Jinchiroki. Jinchiriki. Jincho dot. Jinchiriki, Neru-kun. Yeah Jinchiriki, just like me. Wait, who said that? It's me Neru-kun. Who else could or would talk to you in your head? Right, sorry Benahamonichan. So there are other people like me? Of course Neru-kun, but now's not the time for me to explain it. I'll tell you later okay? Yujito-chan is calling you. Focusing back on the real world, said girl was calling out his name and poking his chest. Naudo. Hello. Anybody home? Oh sorry Yugi-chan. Just thinking. He replied sheepishly, scratching the back of his head. Well, stop thinking. Kawabi and the lady you were with went inside the big house. She said, pointing at the doors that were still swinging shut. Quickly running inside, the two blondes were met with a large and very impressive looking foyer. Luscious and soft carpet covered the ground, intricate patterns adorning the fabric. Small stone Nikos of either one or two tails stood guard at the entrance, their eyes looking directly at the children, as if to say that they were free to enter. 
Frantically looking around, Naruto finally caught a fleeting sight of familiar purple hair as it disappeared around a corner. Come on Yugi-chan. We gotta catch up to them. Grabbing the girl's hand, he drug her down the hall, nimbly avoiding the other people walking the halls. When they turned the corner, all that greeted them was a large set of metallic doors, a small numbered gauge-like device above them. The needle slowly rose from far left side of the device, starting at one and dinging at every new number. What? Where did they go? He wondered aloud, looking around again, totally oblivious of the doors in front of the pair. They went in there, the elevato. Yujito said, pointing to the door as the needle stopped on the last number, five. We have to wait for it to come back down. Sighing she flopped on the ground, her blue feline-like eyes staring at the dial, silently pleading for it to hurry up. Naruto, not used to being still or quiet for very long, looked around, taking in the surroundings. It was much like the lobby, the carpet was the same, the wallpaper was the same, deep brown thunderbolts rolling down a white canvas, the occasional Nico pouncing in between bolts. A loud ding broke him out of his observations as the doors opened again, revealing a somewhat panicked Yugao. There you are Naruto. I was worried when you weren't on the elevator. She sighed in a relieved tone, holding the doors open to let the two young Jinchuriki in. Pressing the top button on the control panel, the purple-haired Kinoichi couldn't help but laugh at Naruto's startled face as the large box lurched to life, slowly rising from the ground. Is this your first time on an elevator, Narukun? The boy nodded shakily from his spot clinging onto her leg. Wow, what a squatty cat. Yujito laughed out, so hard that tears were coming to her eyes. Naruto, not one to take insults lightly, stuck out his tongue at the laughing girl, only resulting in her laughing more at him. Her laughing soon stopped after the trio exited the elevator, Naruto still glaring hard at the girl. They walked in silence to the end of the hallway, stopping at a door that had five to nine on the door. This is where we're staying Naru-kun. Yugao announced, opening the door. The boy's eyes flew open at the side in front of him. Not only was the apartment itself about twice the size as his old one back in Konoha, this new one was much nicer as well. It had three rooms aside from the main room which was a conglomerate of many rooms. The entryway, a stocked kitchen with a small dinner table and a small den, complete with a TV and two far wall, had a large glass sliding door, beyond it was one of the terraces that were under most windows. Only this one was a bit wider and longer along the building. Exiting out of one of the rooms, Karabi made his way over to the trio. This is it, a freshly prepared penthouse suite for the newest members of the Kumagakur family. A warm smile appeared on his face as he picked up Yujito and set her on his shoulders once again. He headed for the door, turning one last time at the two. Hope you enjoy your stay here. If you need anything, I actually live downstairs in 2 to 8 with little Yugi here, so don't hesitate to drop on by. Will do Kurabi-san. Yugao smiled back, closing the door behind the Kumonin. Turning back to Naruto, her smile grew wider as she saw Naruto already on the balcony, looking over the railing. Joining the boy, she leaned on the railing, her eyes panning the sunset. It's beautiful here. She sighed, her smile turning sad at the fact that she left all her friends back in Konoha for this new life here in Kumo. But all that didn't matter, it was for Naruto and his well-being, so it was a good trade-off. Looking over at her young charge, she wondered what exactly he had given up to come here. Obviously, he's not going to be treated like a demon, so that's a good thing. The only people I'm pretty sure he ever trusted there were Hokage-sama, Kakashi-senpai, and myself. The loud yawn momentarily brought her out of her thoughts. Turning again to the young blonde, she couldn't contain the giggle that pressed against her lips at the sight. Leaning on the bar, his arms dangling over the side slightly was Naruto, lightly snoring in a peaceful sleep. Picking him up gently, she carried him to one of the rooms, the door adorned with a spiral not much different than the one on his shirt, on closer inspection however, the spiral was made up of nine red kitsune tails. Forgetting the door she made a beeline for the small bed and laid him down in it, pulling the red covers over his small body. Good night Naruchan. Sleep well. She said, pecking him on the forehead before leaving, not noticing the boy snuggling up to a small kitsune plush toy on the bed. Wait a minute, he did say that he would spend time with someone else and their family, but who was it? K-O-N-O-H-A. Shouts of joy rang up from the crowded streets as people paraded around the streets, partying like animals. The reason was that a certain member of the civilian council had said that the demon boy was dead, causing the villagers to break out in celebration. The council member had said that the declaration was straight from the Hokage's mouth earlier that day. The combined council of prominent villagers and clan heads stared with wide-eyed shock at the elderly Hokage in front of them. That's right. Naruto Uzumaki was pronounced dead at 9.52 last night. He repeated, his eyes panning over the village's elite ninja clans. Most of the clan heads had looks of absolute shock, they were some of the few that actually knew of the QB being the guardian of Konoha and pitied the boy for his burden. 
Of these clan heads, most had even helped little Naruto escape his pursuers from time to time. Two of the more prominent heads, however, had different faces. The ever stoic face of the ashy Hayuga held his ever present look of disinterest and uncaring. In truth, he did know of the boy's burden, but he didn't care whether he lived or died. The only way he would even give the boy a second look is if he became attached or involved with either of his daughters, Hinata and Hanabi, so the news of his death meant nothing to him. The other head had a look that held neither shock or lack of interest was Fugaku Uchiha. The patriarchal Uchiha had, however, an almost happy look, his lips pulled into a twisted kind of smile. To him that boy was nothing but the demon itself. He hated Naruto even more for the fact that he had befriended his youngest daughter, Sayuki, and in turn Mitachi, his elder daughter and heir, and even his wife, although Makoto never had felt the same way that he did on the young boy. Always calling him a hero or some other name he was undeserving of in his eyes. Now that he was dead and gone, he could set his family straight. But what of the QB? A certain cripple spoke up, his singular eye glaring at the aged Kage. Surely its essence was retained. We still have its power correct. No we do not Danzo. The way that the Yandame sealed the QB away, the moment Naruto dies, the QB would. Saratobi partially lied. Although part of that statement was true, Minato wasn't called the premier expert in Fuenjutsu for nothing. He was the one who perfected the Shaiki Fuen in the first place, so it was only common knowledge that he would have thought of ways to counteract the binding of chakras that the seal induced. Of course, the only copies of the instructions were all the way in Kumo, with Naruto, but the old Warhawk didn't need to know that. That is all, this meeting is over. With that, Saratobi briskly stood up and left the room, silence following him. The silence continued as one by one the members of the council left, only Danzo still in the room. For once the cripple's face was not in its cool and collected visage. Anger and frustration almost visibly rolled off his body, his frame shaking at the magnitude of his rage. Crap, 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 crap. He mentally screamed to himself. With a snap of his fingers, a blank masked figure appeared by his side. Yes, Danzo Samaic. Before he could even get the words out of his mouth, Danzo's hand formed a vice-like grip around the man's neck, slowly choking the life out of him. Who does that old fart think he's fooling? There's no way that little brat could have died so easily from those little wounds. He's been through worse, and that infernal demon has healed him every time back to perfect health. Something is very wrong here. He thought aloud. He was unaware of the sudden lack of struggling and choking from his subordinate. Looking at the man, his eye hardened at the dead man's limp form, utter contempt on his face. Without any other thought, he dug his fingers completely though his neck, severing his head from the rest of his body which fell like a rock on the floor, blood pouring from the unhinged head still on his fist. That QB brat, he's alive somewhere. Now just where is he? Her and T-I-M-E. Although it seemed everyone else in the streets were partying and drinking in celebration of the riddance of the demon spawn, two people however were certainly not. Both were utterly appalled at the village's behavior along with their own clans. Spurred on by the clan head to hate the boy that the head family would shelter on occasion, even have over for dinner, seemed extremely bigoted towards the boy. The elder of the two had to maintain a calmer persona than the younger for the sake of her youngest daughter who was walking with them. She needed to see that her mother was level-headed and could control her anger, a trait she wished her elder daughter could duplicate. Said daughter, however, wore her anger on her sleeve. She was usually stoic in public to everyone other than some of her family, a few colleagues and a certain blonde boy, to whom she would actually smile and be herself with. But she wouldn't have been promoted an Anbu captain at the age she was if she couldn't control her emotions, but as was normal for humans, even she could let her anger get the best of her. Now being a perfect time. How dare they act like this is a victory or something. Nari-chan was the best thing to happen to this village since Kashina sensei came here. All these bigots are ruining what Yandame sama wanted for him, but they're also hurting little Sayuki. I wish I could just attack all these people along with the others. That'd make everything. Onichan. The raven teen jumped slightly, her anbu training lapsing in her rage. Turning to her family, her face softened when her eyes met the similar coals of her little sisters. Are you okay Onichan? You've been quiet for a really long time. Her cute voice asked, trying to figure out the ways of her 14-year-old sister. I'm fine Sayuki-chan, just thinking. Mitachi reassuringly smiled down at her, holding her hand tighter. They continued walking down the joyous streets, trying their best to tune out shouts of happiness at Naruto's alleged death and to there their destination, a small family-owned Raymond stand that was once the favorite of a certain blonde family friend. It surprised the older Raven that the restaurant was even open, Naruto had always been their best customer, so she expected them to be mourning his loss. Hi am chan Tuchi-san. The small Ichiha cried happily, a large smile on her face. The two aforementioned cooks smiled back at the girl, a pang of grief however appearing soon after that only Mikoto and Mitachi saw. No doubt it was caused by the absence of her usual eating partner. 
isn't Naruto-kun here yet? Um, well, Naruto is, the man began, his eyes avoiding the gaze of the small girl. They met with both her older sister's and mother's eyes, both holding a saddened look at the reason to why the boy wasn't here. However the gazes also held traces of something akin to a plea to keep quiet, as if asking him to stay quiet, as to keep the childlike purity that Sayuki still had. He was sent on a vacation by Hokage-sama himself. He lied, a smile returning to his face. Although the lie worked on the girl, her countenance still fell, but he promised he'd meet me, Onichin, and Kasen here for dinner. She said, a downcast tone taking over her voice. Noticing this change in expression, A.M. quickly began to cook the child's usual order, now, now, no long faces. Naruto-kun wouldn't like to see you like this if he was here, so why don't we see a smile, hmm? He's always said that he likes it when you smile, even calling you cute. Instantly, Sayuki's face broke out in a furious blush adorning her face at the thought of her crush, calling her cute. She quickly tried to hide it by ducking her head into the bowl of shrimp ramen placed in front of her, eating the noodle soup hastily, ignoring the giggles from her family and the female cook. The other two Ichihas soon joined in eating their own orders, passing the time with the Ichirikas, with idle chatter, wisely avoiding the subject of Naruto, as to not upset the small girl again. Mitachi was the first to finish and stood up from her stool, lifting up the flap to exit. Where are you going Onichin? Turning to her younger sister, Mitachi gave a soft and reassuring smile. I have to go get ready for a mission, but don't worry, I'll be home soon came her reply, exiting under the flap, giving a knowing look to her mother, before fully disappearing behind the white flaps and into the busy streets. Sayuki quickly turned her focus away from the still-moving fabric and back to her bowl, picking out one of the few remaining prawns in the soup. L-A-T-E-R. After finishing their meal and paying for it, Mikoto left the stand, Sayuki sleeping soundly in her arms. Knowing what was being attended to at the compound, she decided to take a much-needed detour to answer a few questions she had, and only a certain monkey could answer them, the place to find him being the Hokage Tower. Leaving her sleeping daughter in the care of the assistant at the front desk, she angrily stomped up the stairs to his office, an aura akin to annoyance, rage, and pure unbridled fury surrounding her. She definitely wanted those answers now. But S-A-R-U-T-O-B-I. A fit of shudders ran through the aged fire shadow, a feeling of almost pure fear that only one person he knew of could produce in him. No, it can't be her. Kashina's been dead for a little over five years. He thought, the memory of the red-haired woman's anger and the actions upon those whom it was directed towards. But, no this feeling and aura was of someone totally different than Kashina, but it also was a reminder of the woman, and it scared the living crap out of him. Whoever it is, I hope they aren't like Kashina. Kami-sama knows that I can't take one of her beatings again. His fears were realized, however, when the doors to his office were nearly blown off its hinges. The perpetrator, a woman with raven black hair and charcoal eyes standing there, her face glaring hard at him. Here is in Saratobi. Where the hell is Naruto? I know he isn't dead so where is he? She yelled out, her eyes changing their color to an intimidating red, three comma marks surrounding the pupil. No, I think Kashina would be better right now. The Kage sighed, slowly meeting the Sharingan eyes of Mikoto Ichiha. I was wondering when someone would question what I said. But to think it would be you of all people, I thought all the Ichiha hated Naruto because of the QB killing most of the clan ninja at the time. Well not everyone was so bigoted. She responded, folding her arms under her chest. Myself and my two daughters are the only members that actually see him as the little boy that he is, Sayuki actually having a crush on him. So where is Naruto? It's obvious he's not dead, I know he's always been in great protection with those other two Anbu along with Mitachi, and I know you would step in if got too bad. Here is inside loudly again, knowing that he had no way out of giving her the explanation. Alright I'll tell you, but this conversation never leaves this room, understand. Betting a nod from the woman, he pressed a finger on the small seal on his desk, a purple wall of chakra sprang up from the ground, quickly disappearing as fast as it arrived. It started after Minato had just sealed the QB inside him, even when he was still in one of the cribs in the hospital. A few of the ninja that had survived the attack decided to attack him while he was sleeping. Luckily, one of the nurses saw it and alerted me before they could kill him. However, these actions didn't stop. Whether it was by poisoning, assassination, or even drowning, ninja and villagers alike tried to kill him repeatedly. Fortunately, an old friend of mine who runs the orphanage took him in and protected him personally the entire, almost never leaving his side through the harsh environment. That still didn't seem to be enough however, as soon as he turned five, the council had him kicked out and put in his own apartment in the slums of the city. The beatings and attacks came much more violent and frequently, so much that I had to put him under constant Anbu surveillance, and only the ones that I could trust, Yugao Yuzuki and Kakashi Haddock. 
both had been students of Naruto's parents, and they both saw him as a hero, treating him with respect and the love of older siblings, spending time with him without their masks on. They also had help by other Anbu and Jonin, including Matachi. That still doesn't explain why he's not here in Konoha. Certainly Kakashi and Yuga were able to keep little Naruto safe all this time right. They were perfectly, up until yesterday that is. Naruto was cornered by villagers and a few genin, which was normal for a night attack on him. However, an Anbu was there as well, making it that much harder for them to protect him. He was in Ichiha as well, using his Sharingan to cast a Jinjutsu to deter both Kakashi and Yugao to lose Naruto while he was being chased by them, allowing the villagers to beat him within an inch of his life. Kakashi and Yugao were both able to get there in time before the other Anbu was able to kill Naruto. He explained, allowing the woman to absorb the information. Tears rolled down her eyes, her form visibly shaken. To think that even an Anbu, the village's elite ninja, would attack an innocent child out of cold blood and for something he couldn't control. So. So where is he now? She asked, holding back the sobs that threatened to break her down. Then Raikage was here when Kakashi and Yugao brought Naruto here. He almost instantly figured out that he was a Jinchuriki, just from seeing his wounds. I asked him to take him to Kumo so he would have a better life there. You see, the people of Kumo are aware of their two guardians, the Nibi and Hachibi, and they see the Jinchuriki as gifts from Kami herself. They treat them with high respect, even though the Nibi Jinchuriki is only a child herself. After I thought about it, I resolved that a life in Kumo is better than hell here in Konoha. Here is unfinished, leaning back in his chair. Naruto is in Kumo with Yuga right now. They both are no longer Konoha citizens, and Ninja, their loyalties are now with Kumagakur. Thank you Hokage-sama. I feel much better now that I know that he is still alive. She said, relief filling her voice. After a small bow, she left his office and returned to her daughter, who was just waking up from her slumber. Picking her up, mother and daughter made their way back to the compound where the unthinkable was happening. The Chiha C-O-M-P-O-U-N-D. Yugaku looked in horror at his eldest daughter. He had just seen her decimate the entire clan in the streets of the compound, save for him, without so much as getting a single scratch on her. Blood drenched her armor and mask, giving her Sharingan an even more fearsome look, even for another wielder of the Dejutsu. W-Y. Why the hell are you killing your own clan? He yelled out, unable to hide the fear in his voice. His only reply was her crimson-stained blade lifting his head off his shoulders. Flicking her father's blood off her sword, she gave one look behind her before sheathing the sword and jumping off into the night. Onichin. Sayuki screamed out, tears pouring out her eyes. She ran to where Mitachi was last, continuously screaming out for the raven the entire time. Bakodo did her best to put on a facade of grief and sorrow as well, kneeling down next to her husband's decapitated body, tears hitting the ground. She knew of what was going to happen from what Mitachi had told her the night previous and was not at all surprised. She had heard Fugaku on more than one occasion talking with the elders of the clan about his plan to stage a coup and seize control of Konoha, as the founder would have wanted. While she was sad that some of the women and young children had to die as well, it couldn't be helped and she knew stayed that way when multiple Anbu along with Hokage arrived. The masked ninja quickly dispersed to look around the compound for any survivors, but after learning of who had just come through here, they doubted that they'd find anyone. They worked in silence, save for one donkey masked man. First something great then this. Who would have ever thought that the Achiha would be obliterated on the same day we learn of the demon brat's death? He said. Now normally this would be fine if he just said it under his breath and he wasn't by Sayuki when he said it. The demon brat. Sniff who is that? She sobbingly asked, tears still sliding down her face. Um. It was just that kid Naruto Uzumaki. He answered, unaware of the three spikes of Kai directed at him. Before he could get another word out, he was shushing it away with Inu who took him straight to Ibiki. But it wasn't before his words got to Sayuki. Then Naruto. He's. She sobbed out, fresh tears flowing like a fountain. All in one day, her life had become horrible, losing most of her family to her sister who she looked up to greatly, and the loss of her best friend and crush. Naruto. So that's it for now, I hope this video is entertaining, if you really enjoyed this video, then please hit that like button, that will be super duper awesome, like aim is 500 likes, also don't forget to smash that subscribe button, thanks for watching guys, take care bye.